Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us on this cool and crisp November day. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime afterward. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phone. This Friday, December 1st, from 4 to 8 p.m., we'll have our annual Christmas by Candlelight tour featuring the State Capitol, Governor's Mansion, Old Capitol, and these museums, all decked out for the holidays and with food and music. We'll have shuttles that will run from site to site, or you can walk or drive your own vehicle. The model trains in town of Possum Ridge will be set up and running throughout the month upstairs here, so if you don't make it to the Candlelight Tour, come back and see those some other day. And then I hope you'll join us next week for History is Lunch, when Stanley Nelson will present the 1966 murder of Ben Chester White, a new look at an old case. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Larry Morrissey and Terrence Shirley as they present Knots in the Safety Net, Oral Histories of the Community Health Centers of Mississippi. Larry Morrissey has worked as an oral history interviewer and project coordinator for more than 25 years and is deputy director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. He earned his MA in Folk Studies from Western Kentucky University. Morrissey is a host of the Mississippi Arts Hour radio show on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Terrence Shirley has worked in healthcare administration since 1980 and served as chief executive officer of the Community Health Center Association of Mississippi since 2021. He earned his BS in political science and government from the University of Southern Mississippi and his master's in public health from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. He is the co-founder of the Drs. Aaron and Ollie Shirley Foundation. We'll hear first from Terrence Shirley, then from Larry Morrissey, and then we'll take questions at the end. Help me welcome Terrence Shirley. Good afternoon, everyone. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all today on a subject matter that is truly near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's, a, it's a space that, that my family and I grew up in. It's a space that my family and I are truly dedicated and committed to. And this is the mission of our life. And thank you for coming. The Community Health Center Association of Mississippi partnered with the Mississippi Humanities Council in 2021 to collect histories from those who have been instrumental in building the largest primary care network in the state of Mississippi for the past 40 years. We're so pleased to work with Larry Morrissey, who has helped capture these oral histories that are now housed with the Department of Archives and History. Many people don't know what community health centers are. Community health centers are also known as federally qualified health centers and exist all over the country, serving more than 30 million people. Health centers receive their operational funding through grants, health insurance companies, private contracts, and patient payments. Health centers are nonprofit organizations run by community boards. And by statute, at least 51% of those board members must be active patients of the organization for which they serve. What's offered at community health centers? Primary care, dental care, women's health, mental health, optometry, pharmacy, and laboratory services. You'll find these health clinics in rural and urban areas, in mobile units, and in school-based clinics all across the state of Mississippi. Federally qualified health center sees a patient no matter what their insurance status is, but they're not, I repeat, they're not free clinics. Patients pay on a sliding fee scale based on their income level, where their balances are covered by the federal grant and other generated revenues. Health centers offer the highest quality of primary care available. They must meet certain quality standards to attain and retain their grant funding as well as their commercial contracts. 
21 community health centers make up the Community Health Center Association of Mississippi. Each health center's director serves on the association's board of directors. The association offers support through training and technical assistance to help those health centers serve their patients. Here are a few quick facts about Mississippi's community health centers, but the most compelling is of a patient seen. More than 311,000 patients were served by Mississippi Federally Qualified Health Centers last year. Larry Morrissey will get in more detail of some of the history of the Federally Qualified Health Centers and the work of the people delivering the health care. But Mississippi made history. They had the first rural health center in this country, located and still operational in Mound Bayou, Mississippi. The health center movement ran in tandem with the civil rights movement, with the federal government first funding these community-based health centers in the 1960s. The Community Health Center Association was chartered in the early 1980s. Three CEOs have served prior to my appointment in July of 2021. But during the association's charter back in 1981, I was on the ground as a young healthcare professional assisting in the establishment of this organization. After decades long career working for community health centers and in hospital administration leadership in South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and in Mississippi, you can say that I've come full circle, especially considering the role that my father, Dr. Aaron Shirley, played along with the first generation leaders in the health center movement. I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank Larry for your research. Thank you for the job well done, and truly looking forward to the evening. Thank you. Oh, clicker, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shirley, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this project. Um, so I'm going to move on to mine. I'm Larry Morrissey. Um, again, want to acknowledge the Mississippi Humanities Council, who was the supported this project through a grant. Uh, Humanities Council, for those who don't know, has been a longtime supporter of oral history projects throughout the state, community level projects, and uh, they've been there steadfast. Also, like to thank Archives and History, who accepted this collection of recordings. So it'll be part of the permanent. It is part of the permanent collection here at Archives and History now. So that's very notable. Ooh. Um, so. Um, just a little bit overview of the project. It was done, we did it over six months last year, the first half of the year. I did tw uh, 18 different interviews, 20 interviewees. There were a couple of them that had a couple of people. The types of people that I talked to uh, would include, holy moly, this thing's going on its own. Okay. Um, uh, clinic directors, CEOs, medical directors, medical professionals that are, you know, longtime medical professionals that are part of... Um, of the CHCs, as well as board members. He mentioned the board members, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that specific history of and, and distinct cultural element of, of, of the CHCs. And so you can see the statewide map, and we, through the interviews, we uh, talked to representatives of 17 of the 21 different uh, CHC systems in the state. Um, the one thing I want to point out, uh, we, um, talking uh, about Dr. Shirley and Dr. Smith, th there is the the interviews that we did were primarily with, with with who I would call the second generation of community health center professionals. So there's kind of the the pioneers, which include Dr. Robert Smith and Dr. Aaron Shirley, Dr. James Anderson, and so I'll. So the focus today is more on these people in, in, over the last 40 years, roughly, who I spoke with. Um, but for people who are interested in learning more about the origins of, of the community health center movement, these are two great books that I used uh, as part of that uh, initial research, including John Dittmer, you know, wrote the local people uh, history of, um, you know, local community organizing in the, in the civil rights movement, both really good books. Um, I'm waiting to see. Okay, this is the one. Yeah. So I just said I only talked to this. I talked to the second generation. The exception for that was I talked to Dr. Robert Smith, one of the uh, still living pioneers of the community health center movement. Um, his resume is as long as 
is this building, so I can't get into that, but, uh, you know, um, had a very long, uh, great interview with him, and he talked about, you know, he was one of the people, he was one of the guy, the guy who helped find the medical professionals who helped uh, support the freedom, uh, the people who came and worked during Freedom Summer, because they couldn't go to a, a regular doctor because they didn't want, you know, the... the they, they were not allowed. So he brought in, he helped organize a group of medical professionals to come in. So in this, inter, in this little segment from his interview, he talks about kind of the aftermath of Freedom Summer and how it kind of led to some initial uh, reporting and stuff that led to the Community Health Center movement. And he also talked about how he became a pilot in, in order to uh, offer medical services in the Delta. A part of Freedom Summer, in addition to providing health care for all of these poor people who were trying to register to vote, like Fannie Lou Hamlin and all that group. She was just a star, but there were people like that in every area of Mississippi who had run into problems for one reason or the other. And we would send physicians to these outposts and also document the lack of health care, which wasn't hard to do. During this time, uh, we had people of every level of medical education, administration, and whatever else that you can name who put their lives and their careers on the line and wanted to be identified with this movement. But nevertheless, when it was some of Freedom Summer was over, we all came together, thought it was a good idea to do a summary and release to people who had made contributions one way or the other and summarize what, what we thought was health care in Mississippi and what some of the solutions would be. And that, that resulted in the call for uh, two centers, one in the south and one in the north. But the focus for the whole damn thing came out of where it came out of the conditions of Mississippi. I had always had this freakish idea that I wanted to fly. So uh, I took flying lessons, and uh, I would fly. I had enough resources to, starting off, I would fly. I would hire a... Uh, rent a plane and a pilot to fly me to Cleveland. And then I'd be picked up in Cleveland and driven to, to my bio every, every Thursday. I'd leave home at 7.30 after making rounds here in Jackson. At 9 o'clock, I'd go to work and, uh, and at, at the health center. 5 o'clock, I would be leaving my bio Going back to Cleveland at 6 o'clock, I'd be back in Jackson and finish my rounds. And I did that for a lot of reasons. And even that was a problem, you know, because of trying to protect myself. I flew from, I borrowed planes from Hawkins to Madison and finally decided, since I didn't have time to go to ground school, uh, that I should come home and run whatever what was then Mississippi Family Health Center. Okay, so Dr. Robert Smith, Dr. Aaron Shirley, and, and others, the kind of initially pioneers, that was a big theme in the interviews that I did, talking to people who were directly mentored by the kind of the original group of doctors that started the Community Health Center movement. So we're going to hear each of these individuals was was kind of mentored by a different person. And so we're going to hear from Dr. Rashad Ali, who's in Laurel, uh, Aurelia Jones-Taylor uh, with the Health Center in Clarksdale, and Dr. Jasmine Chapman, who is at Jackson, who's the CEO of Jackson Hines here in Jackson. I would call myself a disciple of Dr. Robert Smith. When I was a third-year medical student, I had the opportunity to spend some time as an extern under his tutelage. And being in this clinic and being around him, he was my mentor. And uh, I had the opportunity to follow him not only with patients 
in terms of being in rounds and, and going to the hospital to follow him and watch the way that he was conducting himself regarding patients. You know, and many of his patients were exactly what the Community Health Center was designed to do, take care of the uninsured and the underserved. But Dr. Smith, the way that I saw him interact with the patients, and that had a, a, a serious influence on me. It was more of how you would interact with a family member. There was a, an immediate respect for Dr. Smith. However, he interacted with the patients in a way it wasn't like a big, big eye, little you. It was, it was a, a cordial kind of, of relationship that he had. And I thought uh, that was really something outstanding. And there was mad respect for him. To some extent, that's kind of how I interact with, with, with patients today. It's a way that you can interact with patients that allow you to get so much information that I probably could not get if I was a straight necktie kind of wearing guy. What I learned from him primarily was how to handle um, situations, I guess you would say, in terms of dealing with people, how to maneuver the political realm, uh, um, what to say, what not to say. One of the advices he gave me one time, because I was, you know, when you're sitting with people, you're always taking a note. He said, never take a note when I'm talking. Never write a note. Remember everything. I was like, really? I don't know if that is, you need to be engaged in a conversation. You can't be looking down, writing notes. Yeah. You should be able to remember the essence of a conversation. And maybe you write your notes some, some, some later day. And so at this, right now, I can not write notes when I make a conversation. <laughs> it was indelible. One day he walked into my office and said, here, write this grant. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Write this grant. And it was the homeless grant for, the, for Jackson Hines. I'd never written a grant before. And I had to do all my research. I had to go down to the homeless shelters and talk to the people and, and do the needs assessment and figure out what the parts of writing a grant was. And so I wrote this grant based on my best creative knowledge. <laughs> and... I would, really didn't want to send it in. I, wasn't, I was insecure about it. And he was like, first time he hollered at me, bring me that grant. <laughs> I was like, okay, here it is. <laughs> so actually, it must have been done well. He sent it in. He, he read it. He said, it reads well. He sent it in. It got funded. So now I'm a grant writer. So I take that with me to the Mississippi Delta. And so for some reason, he started mentoring me. And first it was talking about the things that they had to go through, how that they didn't first have a place to bring their patients and just all of that history. And history about people that I never met, but he, that he would know and he would, uh, he would talk to us. And it wasn't just me, it was a lot of the young professionals. He wanted us to understand what Jackson Hines was about and to appreciate where we were at that time. And then after I became, I was a dentist at first, and then they, um, they made me dental director. He will always bring me in meetings that I thought was unnecessary because I was a dentist and a dental director, but they used to all these long meetings. I didn't know he was teaching me management. He would teach me things about Chapman, people will forgive you if you make a mistake, but they don't, won't forgive you if you're not consistent. So you need to have what is it that make you make a decision, and you need to know those reasons and be consistent with that. He would teach me that uh, don't be stuck on a decision that you made. When you know better, you should do better. And when you um, see that what you're not doing is not working, then you allow to change, whether it's your ideal or not, to originally do that way. So he, all this time that I was thinking it was unnecessary, that I could be doing something that I thought was uh, different, he was preparing me. And if it wasn't for him, I never, I never would have taken uh, the position of CEO. 
I'm just so blessed to have had him to to mentor uh, me and many other people, and many of the people that in the black community, many of the professors or the ones that have the biggest private practice was mentored by Dr. Anderson, Dr. Shirley, or Dr. Smith. Their reach was beyond the community health center. Um, one of the themes that came across talking to folks that have been in, you know, since the beginning, you know, some many of these uh, satellite loca locations out in other parts of the state started roughly in the 1980s. And a lot of these folks were there at the beginning and talk about kind of the very humble beginnings. You know, they, they're getting a federal grant to bring a community health center to a, a rural, primarily rural area. So they're using whatever building they can find that's open. They're not building, you know, they don't have the money to build. A, a, a lot of them have very nice modern facilities now, but this is a little bit about kind of the humble beginnings of many of the community health centers. And so in 1983, in January, I came and there was, they had a little building down the street here, which was actually the old jail, and I had three rooms in it and a very small waiting room, and we were able to have a lab. And so I had a nurse and a receptionist and myself, and the nurse knew how to run the office. The receptionist knew how to keep books, and uh, they were very, very helpful getting me started. So <clears throat> we opened up and and it started off with zero charts. Just That was the old days, you had paper charts. And uh, we started uh, seeing patients. And uh, things uh, began to grow quite a bit. And uh, somewhere much later on, I quit counting charts at 20,000. So it's not that I was seeing that many patients, but that's how, I mean, it could come through the office. But it was funny because when I had my first board meeting with the board was out in the uh, patient waiting area where you came at first. And it was funny because we'd be having board meeting and, um, you know, we uh, open until six o'clock or until the last patient leave. And um, we'd be having board meeting at six o'clock, and then all of a sudden, a patient come out the uh, uh, exam room uh, uh, from the medical side, and the uh, board meeting. Everybody have to get quiet until the patient goes through, you know. And the board said, "Well, we need a conference room." So, yeah. two of our founding board members were actually on the board of another health center nearby. And they were from here, they were from the Ashland area, and they said, you know, this is something we really need in our area. And they kind of got together and decided we're going to put out a grant. They did. They took over the old lumber yard here, <laughs> the building we started out in on this property, actually. It was a lumber yard that had been closed down, I think. Before that, it was even a military surplus store. So, I mean, it's, it's had multiple purposes over time. And through the years, they built onto that, really almost had a Frankenstein of a building <laughs> until we built our new campus a number of years ago. Um, uh, Mr. Shirley mentioned this earlier. He talked about kind of uh, mentioned the idea that, you know, community health centers are not free clinics. And so there was a lot of misperception in communities about community health centers. And so that's another big theme in this project has been the ongoing work that, um, that the staff and, and people around the centers have to do to educate uh, local people about their, about their, um, about their services. In small community, you know, you had your general practitioner, which was the general doctor, of medicine, and they used to be the, you know, interact with the patients and what have you. And then the community health center came on board, whereby it gave you a more enhanced to make sure it didn't make no difference whether you had money or not, you could still could come be seen at the family health center. But even in those community, they projected a lesser quality of community health, health center services, saying that they are free clinic, they like the health department, you don't get quality care and all this kind of thing, but we had to ensure the community that the same providers, the same nurses, the same administrators have the same credentials as you have in the private sector. 
So uh, that's what a lot of things we had to, hurdles that we had to get over to uh, let them know that there's no less of quality of care in the community health center than you have in the private sector. We encourage patients to always ask questions. We want you to leave there with a good understanding of what is going on with your body, how we can prevent uh, progression from happening in the disease process, and to make sure that you understand totally what's going on. And if you have questions, we want you to, we want our patients to be encouraged to ask those questions before they leave the office. And we often tell them, if you leave here and you forgot to ask us something, either call us back or jot it down for the next visit. So we don't want to shoo them off. We don't want them to think at no point that we're rushing them. We don't ever want to rush a visit. We want to make sure that we're providing quality care, not just quantity care. Quality is the best for our patients. Talking to a lot of other directors and, and clinic, you know, people, heads of clinic around the state, a lot, most people are in a growth mode. Yeah. And I'm just curious about what are the factor, what do you see as the factors that's, that's driving this pretty substantial growth? I think need. The need and also the, um, the unification nationally under the National Association of Community Health Centers. Even though uh, we are different, Jackson Hines and different ones around, what's driving the growth is the need and also the fact that we see people regardless of their ability to pay. It doesn't mean we don't charge people. We charge people according to their ability to pay. But we don't look at what somebody drove up in or how they're dressed and decide that they can afford to pay. If they say they cannot afford to pay, we say, well, this is what you owe. How much can you pay? And then we'll work out something. So that is very much a, um, a service mode kind of thing. In addition to changing perceptions among uh, community members, there's also, as, as community health centers have expanded and gone into new communities, there's sometimes pushback from the, the other parts of the medical community where they feel like you're coming in, you're taking our business, what are you coming in here for? So uh, these folks, Dr. Margaret Gray from uh, Pearl, Dr. Uh, James Monroe from Smithville, and John Fairman, who we just heard from, kind of speak to this this element of their work? Some of what we found is that there's a lot of objections to community. The experience is, is that you got a community of partners that support the community health centers. And those partners are like Head Start, community action agencies, housing and urban development, you got the food bank groups, and you got the, the aging agencies, the elderly senior citizen programs. And so we are kind of like a, a group that support each other. But then there are some others that in the medical community are not as supportive of community health centers. And they see us, some see us as competition because we see people regardless of their ability to pay. And we see Medicaid patients. So we interact with them with, with those patients. And so a lot of those patients before we got to the community were kind of locked out of health care. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing them, but we are also seeing their family members who have Medicaid and Medicare. That's where the competition becomes in. So when we initially go in the community, we have to make sure that we, that we partner with our, our partners who support the effort. So we build our momentum around that because I found that if you approach directly the medical community without this, this other overwhelming uh, support from other community partners, then they can't close you out. And that's, a, that's a something that I think that I've tried to tell the hospitalist, I mean hospital administrators and people, look, we're keeping, we're taking care of these sick people that you don't want in your emergency room because they don't have any money there and they don't have any money here. But we've got a little, 
we'll charge them five dollars or something and mm -hmm. and actually get them and so they don't have to go and spend a day in the emergency room just for a coal. I can tell you in particular when we started improving and expanding in in Bolivar County and in Mount Bayou and then we opened the Cleveland Clinic, we got some pushback. So what I did was went on the offensive. I would meet with the medical societies and tell them what we were planning on doing. And I said, if anybody here wants in on this, we are not trying to compete with you or run you out of business. Here's the data that shows the number of underserved people, the number of people who are not getting service. Are you caring for all these people? The answer was no. Well, then what's the problem? And so when we first went to Indianola, the ex-hospital administrator there, you would have thought we came for his firstborn. He was really not happy, but he was honest. I took the demographic data with me, and I said, this shows that this many people in Indianola, greater Indianola, are not being served, not even haven't seen anybody at all. Are you taking care of these people? And he said, why, no. I said, OK, then there's more than enough for us to do it. Besides, we're not, we're not coming here to open a hospital. We're going to utilize your hospital. Um, Earlier, uh, Mr. Shirley talked about the, the element of the board. That, so each community health center has a community board, and the majority of the members have to be active uh, patients at the, at, the, at the health center. So these are some uh, Jill Bishop from East Central uh, Mississippi's uh, health center. Of course, James Oliver again from Claiborne County, and Mary, oh, Mary Kimes, who is a longtime board member with the uh, Mallory Community Health Center in Lexington. 51% uh, of our, our boards have to be patients of our health centers, and we try to have more than that, but 51% uh, is the minimum. So they have a unique perspective of being patients of the clinic. They're there, they see the actual flow of things, they know the appearance of the clinics, they know the actions of the staff members, whether it be front office lab or provider staff. So they're able to give us feedback at each meeting if, if they've had a positive or a negative experience. It's great when they come in and tell us or tell me what a positive experience that they've had at their, at their visit. It in turn allows me to go back to staff and say, hey, you saw one of our board members a while back and they expressed appreciation to the entire board to the quality care that they got when you saw them as a patient. I think the community um, does view them in a, in a higher manner. There's not a lot of uh, publicity, so there's not a, um, a lot of people probably who know or exactly on who's on our board of directors. It's on our web page so that the information's out there, but it's not something that we promote actively as to who our board members are. And there are challenges with trying to get someone to serve the, the quality people may, might be afraid that they're not going to be able to dedicate the time to it as they need to. Most of them work. Some of them are retired, but the ones that work are hardworking people that sometimes have challenges in making all the board meetings. One of the, the uh, benefits of, well, uh, many of the benefits of having board members uh, start with was the fact that, you know, they listen in the community. They listen to the needs of the community and they are able to bring that to us. They suggest new services that we should look into. They've done that since I've been here and we ventured into those uh, different services. The other thing with board members is the fact that uh, they are so caring in the community. What we do is uh, we try to make it, we request that all board members attend our clinic. You know, in other words, is that if you, if, if it's not good enough for you to uh, come and get services here, then why should you be a board member? You know, and, and our board members are open to that. They li like the provider. Uh, they do a lot of recommendations as far as uh, when we're looking for um, doctors, nurses, uh, whoever, a lot of time, if they know people, you know, they'll tell us. As a board member and as an active member in my church, I felt that because I knew people 
that I would be able to help us to grow more, that we would be able to get more patients. Uh, we didn't have the budget to advertise like larger uh, businesses and corporations do. So uh, uh, most of our advertisement was by word of mouth. So since that was our best avenue at that time, as a board member, I felt that I needed to be a part of that word-to-mouth system. Well, tell me about your recruitment efforts. Well, first of all, you have to talk about it all the time. And you have to dispel some of the rumors and what have you that are out in the community already. So my job was to talk positively about Mallory to my church members, to my sorority sisters, to my family members. Just about all of my family members are now patients at Mallory. While I was doing the, the interviews, of course, took place between January and June of last year. So COVID was still a highly present kind of in, in, in just the room. Uh, you, you can hear some muffled, some of these people sound muffled because they, we, we, had mas we were masked when we were doing these interviews some in the earlier part of the spring last year. So um, it was, you know, COVID was very much a present part of the conversation at that time. And so had each person talk about kind of the response of their center and um, a big theme that came through is the trust that the community health centers have built up over the years and how that helped impact kind of the, 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 the spread of, of how they um, were able to help people in their community with it. In regards to our approach to community engagement around the COVID, we decided to have a physician who becomes the expert. And the expert will make sure that he makes rounds to talk to communities. So when we first started out doing all of the COVID testing and so forth in the clinic, and all, all we, we found out that we needed to go out into the community. So we made it our business to go out into all of these small communities and, and do the testing so where people can just walk up. We are probably have a high profile when it comes to COVID and COVID-19 and our community engagement as well as having uh, professionals who can talk about it and, and teach others and train others. Um, when our Dr. Isiwani has even spoken with a Congressional Black Caucus, with, with, with certain other entities on the federal level where there's been opportunities to speak. Uh, so. We have a very high profile as regards to that, and I think our community, we, the schools, really recognize the fact that we are in the schools and we are able to help them keep the schools open. I think that is quite an accomplishment when it comes to our work with communities. Yeah. That if you're supposed to be something, you got to be it in the worst of time. If you're supposed to be the safety net, you're supposed to be the safety net. And so when COVID happened, we uh, immediately brought the team in, and we was the first non-public organization to do testing in the, in, the, in the state of Mississippi. Even though we were afraid of it, they still knew that I wasn't going to make them do anything that I wasn't willing to do myself. And they weren't going to do anything without being protected with the right PPE and all of that. When they were saying that the blacks weren't going to do it because of the history with the Tuskegee thing and that, we knew that that wasn't true. We knew that when they found that it was available at Jackson Hines or any community health centers and that we was advocating uh, to get tested or get vaccinated, they was going to come. We had a protocol at the clinic to, to make sure that everybody felt safe coming in. So you were actually able to pull into the parking lot, call the front desk, and they would send someone out to check you in there. And after everything else had been taken care of, then you would go in one at a time to see the doctor, and then you would come out. 
so that we, we didn't have the people sitting in the waiting room and nobody was afraid of getting infected by anyone else. And because of that protocol, people continued to come to receive our services. Mm -hmm. We have a mobile unit and for the vaccinations, we actually had people to sit in the cars in the parking lot and then people from the mobile unit would go over and give you the uh, vaccine right in your car. You had to wait the 15 minutes to make sure you were gonna be okay. And once you were okay, then you were released to leave and you had received the service. You never got out of your car. You only came in contact with the medical professional that took your vitals and gave you your vaccine. Um, a big part of the, the funding mechanism for the community health centers is federal money, federal grants. And so advocacy, advocating for that funding is an important part of what the leadership does. And, and talking to a lot of folks, it was interesting to see that Mississippi has a leadership position in terms of national advocacy as well. And so uh, we start off with, with uh, Mr. Shirley talking about that. Mississippi typically has had leaders in Washington that sat on powerful committees, i.e. Thad Cochran. And because of that, those relationships that the Mississippi people have with those legislators helps in the national level. And what happens is oftentimes our national association will reach out to Mississippi people to come and be. And when I was in Florida, and I'm a Mississippi product, so I'll, I'll claim this was my Mississippi heritage. When I was in Florida, I would, Knack would fly me up to Congress and testify before Congress three or four times a year because they knew that this was who we could reach. And so I was looking forward to doing that and I, COVID is going to make it virtual this year. Yeah. But, uh, but that was, so we have our Mississippi delegation that has those relationships as well. And so that I think right now is probably one of the biggest things that Mississippi does for the, the nation as it relates to community health centers is they have those people in Congress that are in leadership roles and they have access to them. And the federally qualified health centers have enjoyed stronger support than the Defense Department budget. And if you can get Margaret Taylor Greene, Tom Cotton from Arkansas, and um, the, the uh, guy from South Carolina to agree, they don't even agree on daylight. <laughs> and, and that's the way in which we've done it by localizing the politics nationally. And that's what's meaningful. Yeah. And when the late Senator Cochran died, just before he died, I was in D.C. visiting on an advocacy trip. And I mentioned about us recently opening up a clinic in Myersville. And he said, oh, yeah, and Mayor Short, and so on and so on. And he said, tell her I said hi, and so on. I was just talking wow. to him last month. And wow. so I said, OK, cool. I went right back and made sure the Mayor Short sent him a letter, all right? Uh, so that's one thing is to make sure you, you've heard the old adage, all politics is local. So we try to make the message local to the representatives. And that's the secret to the strength of how the nationally we've gotten funded. The first year we were, I was writing that first grant application, I went to get an endorsement from Trent Lott. And he said, well, Mrs. Stevens, I need for you to know that I am philosophically opposed to spending tax money for health care. And that's the responsibility of our doctors and dentists. And they tell me that, that they do charity work and take care of that problem. And so I, I just don't feel that that's, I, I can support your application. So the second year I went, we were serving North Gulf Ward and we were serving in Socia. And, and we had a lot of people Clearly, I mean, we've got a, lot, a large majority of Republicans, uh, are, but people who were opposed to so social services, a lot of them. And so the second year, he repeated to me exactly the same thing. So finally, the third year, the number of clients that we were serving that I knew were in his voting group. 
uh, had really grown. So I, I walked in, and this time I said, Mr. Lott, I'm Carlin Stevens. I don't know whether you remember me or not, and but I am I remember very well that you're philosophically opposed to the use of federal funds for health care. And so I've just dropped by today to tell you that we are going to start denying health care to people that uh, have it and, and just say it's because our, our congressman, you know, opposes this. And his eyes got big and he kind of sat up in his chair and he said, oh, you're serving a lot of people? And I said, yes, I am, a lot of people. He said, well, I didn't think about it that way. And so before I went out of his office, uh, he assured me that, that I would receive a, a letter of support the next day. And do you know that he became a really easy, you know, happy to support us after that for all those years. I mean, and he was getting good feedback. Our time is running short. And I want to make sure there's time for questions, so I apologize. I'm going to skip through this one section and get to our kind of closing um, the Where do uh, you people. And so just a couple of parting thoughts from Dr. James Monroe from Smithville and then uh, Dr. Jasmine Chapman from Jackson Hines. One of the things that we do, we take care of the people that nobody else wants. And I, I'm fine with that. I've always been fine with that. I came up poor, and I, I struggled, and my family struggled, and I was very appreciative of the people who did what they could do to help me out. And I mean, it really made an impression on me. Not that I was suffering, but my family was. So whenever I find a community that, that wants to help the underserved, yeah, I want to be a part of it. And uh, that's just been my philosophy. If you, oh. Sorry, jumping the gun here. If you are in the community, and your community might be a community of poor, it might be a community of uninsured, it might be a community of wool, it may, might be of all these things, but when you're in the community, you bring hope. You bring hope to people that they can get good health care. And you also bring in hope to youth and, the, and young people that there are many things that you can do. You might have never seen a, a RN or a, a dentist or a person of your color that be in charge of things. You might have not seen the accountants or all these different careers that it takes to run a community health center. But when you see them and you see and know their history, you know that they went to similar schools that you went to. They live in your neighborhood. You bring hope. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Goodwin for any questions about the project. Yeah, we have time for questions. If anyone has a question, raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. So my question is about funding in that, so there's federal grants, Medicare reimbursement, Medicaid reimbursement, private insurance, and private pay by the patients. What does that breakdown look like in Mississippi, and what does that breakdown look like nationally? Mr. Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> Mississippi is always at the bottom of the list in every aspect that we have to address. And you know, a third of the population that the community health centers are seeing are Medicaid, Medicaid patients. And so if you think about that, and you think about trying to make a dollar, your, your bill is a dollar, and you're getting 30, well actually you're not even getting 30 cents on the dollar when you start talking about the Medicaid reimbursement, but that's a whole nother story. Um, <clears throat> it's a business. And that's what people need to realize, it's a business. And we have to keep our doors open as well. And so what the misnomer is that our federal dollars and whatever state dollars we get support our operations at 100%. Doesn't come close. So we need paying patients as well. So we do have those commercial contracts, we do have the private pays, and what we do want to make sure is that the quality of care that we provide and the services that we provide you should want to walk through that door. 
I get my care at a health center. I've always gotten my care at a health center. My family gets the care at the health center. So as that board member spoke, if you're not willing to come here, don't be on the board. So we are, you're looking at 70 cents that we need to try to find is really what you started talking about. And the federal dollars don't support 100% of our operations. I applaud the work that has gone into establish, I mean, establishing the community uh, medical service. Uh, but I, at the same time, I think the, the medical system in the United States is failing. Uh, that uh, you go into the emergency room, even with insurance up my arm, you wait six hours to see a doctor even when you're going in by ambulance, six hours to see a doctor. When you, get, when you quiz the doctor, well, where the hell you've been? Oh, well, they had to call me in at nine o'clock uh, because uh, we didn't have enough. You know, we have to staff according to uh, the, the way we can expect, expect patients. That's your emergency room, people, that we all get into. I ask questions uh, that why can't we move to a national health system like Australia, like the United Kingdom? They all rank ahead of us in health care. Canada ranks ahead of us in health care. Germany, Australia, New Zealand, all these countries rank ahead of us in health care, and we play around with the hopscotch type medical uh, system that patients, they can come to see you, but what happens when they go to the hospital? Are they admitted to the hospital? Uh, what, what happens when St. Dominic closes their uh, depression uh, units and lays off 150 uh, people? It's because we're financially unstable. Our, our medical system is financially unstable. Uh, and that's my questions. Um, to not be, oh, look, no, I'm a Shirley, I'll do it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Medicaid expansion. If you're not going to do Medicaid expansion, then we need to infuse enough resources that will cover the people that would have been covered by Medicaid expansion. And call it whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> Prevention. We don't focus on prevention. We're a profit-driven institute, we're a profit-driven system. And until we get the profitability out of this in this manner, we will always be driving or trying to catch up in that particular boat. And finally, the board member from Coastal that had the conversation with Mr. Lott, that's national. And as long as you have decision makers in decision making positions, locally, statewide, and nationally, that's the struggle that we're having today. We have been doing this for 50 years plus, and we're still on a continuing resolution in the funding stream in the budget in Washington. Why are we on a continuing resolution? Why are we not funded? Why do we have to go beg every year to do what we do, providing services to the people that nobody else, Mr. Fairman said, that nobody else wants to serve, but they don't want you serving them either. So we're still struggling. You know, we got, to, we got to the budget until January, I believe, but again, we'll be flying up to D.C., meeting with the members again, reminding them that we're taking care of your family members that you have forgotten about or really don't care about. I really uh, enjoyed this. <clears throat> My question is about the oral histories. Are they closed now? Are you continuing them? And then also, uh, have you thought to, uh, besides the board members who are patients, to expand your population to also do oral histories on some patient population? I think that would be a great idea. Um, I, uh, we were just having a discussion prior to 
uh, the start of the presentation about the possibility of expanding. This, of course, was kind of like trying to get a, a, a representation of the whole state and different types of people in different regions. So it was, you know, um, who was available. So maybe it wasn't always the perfect person to be interviewed. But I, I think the patient side would be, was something that wasn't uh, looked at, and that, I think that's a really great idea. We have a question from the live stream. Do the second generation community health center leaders consider themselves heirs to the gains of the civil rights movement? Second generation are old enough to have been impacted by the civil rights movement. They recognize the shoulders from which they stand upon. They acknowledge it willingly, openly, and freely. The, the, our job, those of us that will be at some point sunsetting in this space. Our job is to make sure that we keep doing these types of conversations. We keep, I try to make it a point to have people that, I, that, that have expressed any kind of interest in providing services to the, to the underserved. I try to find a space in wherever I am and having them come through and work with and or shadow and learn and see. When I was at the University Medical Center, I made sure that that was something that we, we did, um, compensated them sometimes when we can find some funds. But again, it's opening that, their, their eyes to say, you know, this is a livelihood that can be rewarding and ultimately is getting to the point where compensation is competitive and that also helps in that gain. So we, we do what we can, they do what they can. They have a lot of people working summers with them. They have a lot of people volunteering. So yes, they, they recognize from whence they've come and they have not forgotten. Healthcare system in this country really got a spotlight shown on it with COVID and made everybody equal. You couldn't pay enough money to get in a hospital, regardless of who you were. In Mississippi, so many health organizations, hospitals, clinics, whatever, closed because of a lack of funding. You certainly saw your population increase, I'm sure, because of those hospitals closing. What is the future of health care in Mississippi for rural residents? The session starts January 4th, I believe. <laughs> we will be emphasizing and again, going down again, explaining. We, we, Mississippi gave back more money than you care to hear about. And that's a shame. And we will be reminding them of that. We will be reminding them of how Mississippi stepped up. Our organization, the Community Health Center Association, received an $11 million grant for COVID activities that we funneled through the federally qualified health centers in the state. Actually, it was through, we actually ran it through three states. So our office ran Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And we provided 30 plus thousand vaccinations during that period. And so we've given, we've shown that it can be done. It's, we've shown that we are good stewards of the resources. We become a model. And so we, you know, this is what we'll be preaching downtown. We're a red state. That's the reality of it. We are a red state. And somehow we got to get the mindset of the leadership that's, a, that's in this red state to recognize it's apolitical when it comes to health care. It's apolitical when you need to provide services to those that are most needy. And again, this is, this is where we'll be standing. This will be our position, nationally and locally. Hi. My um, question uh, has to do with the, the uh, culture of of um, people who, who do not take advantage of uh, health care. They don't go to the doctor when, when they should go or they, they wait too late to go. And that I, I, I think that that's, that's been embedded in the, the culture prob probably because um, um, previous um, conditions where, where um, health care was not available to, to these people. Yes. Um, 
one thing about the community health centers nationally, you know, they do get out into the community. They are community health centers. And health fairs are done. We have school-based clinics, so we, we can see people there. So again, it's just something that we just have to continue to do what we do, and we just got to focus on. And people have, have constraints. You know, they have financial constraints. They have uh, transportation constraints. They, they have all types of things that we are trying to fight through and work through. And we've been doing this again for 50 years, and you know, we know that it works. And we just have to keep doing what we're doing and keep chugging along. We've come to the top of another hour. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, remember that we have the old Jack, the Christmas by Candlelight tour this Friday from 4 to 8. Come be a part of that. Come back next week for History's Lunch with Stanley Nelson. Today, help me thank Larry Morrissey and Taryn Shirley for this fantastic look into the community health centers of Mississippi.